We have more people now. Great. Okay. So this is weird. <laughs> yes, it is. Do you guys see me and hear me? I see and hear you, Christine. Okay. Yep. Hi, Christine. Hi. Good to see you all virtually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Everybody at home? Yes. Oh, I'm except not. Mark isn't. <laughs> oh, that's right. Mark isn't. Just for this, though. Hello, welcome. Hello. Hi. We'll do introductions eventually, but I think people are still signing on, so. Okay, so my video is right now. Okay. Are you going to play a tune for us? <laughs> uh, that's okay. <laughs> this is where I work. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is my office. Yeah, the, the, what I'm worried about is, uh, I mean, right now, this is all an adjustment, but I could get used to this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Especially, you know, social distancing, it's not that hard for introverts. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And most mathematicians are introverts. <laughs> exactly. It really hasn't changed my job that much, honestly. What has changed is having a nine-year-old boy <laughs> in my workplace. <laughs> if you miss that, when we go back to the office, I can provide you with a nine-year-old boy. I mean, provide. <laughs> I'm not so sure you can pro provide me with one quite as obnoxious as the one I have. I just ordered my son a drum set. Oh, you did? Well, that's great. He, he started drums a month ago, and I thought, now that we're home, he might as well get the whole thing. What kind did you get? Uh, I got a. Uh, Odvery or Odary Cafe kit. Okay. It's like a compact set that adults could use, but he's right. six, so. Yeah, they're, they're sometimes called cocktail kits. Okay. Um, this is new to me, Richard. Yes, this this one is. Uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of adults have exactly that kind of thing. Is he taking lessons? Uh, he well now they're virtual, but yeah, right. he is. Actually, my daughter takes lessons, but she also gives lessons. Oh. And and she um, on Monday gave gave her first lesson virtually and it went just fine. Or actually, she gave three lessons virtually and it went just fine. Awesome. Yeah, and I I have two friends who are uh, guitar teachers and they move and they've been moving to virtual and they say that it's, it's pretty seamless. It just requires that I sit there the whole time and like help with stuff. How old is like, he? He's six. Six. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Whereas, like, when the teacher's there, I can do something for a half hour. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of it. The, the, the kids just require a lot more attention. Hi, Brian. Hi, Richard. And you are in Pittsburgh. Yes. Right. Nice to see your uh, your audio set up there. Yeah, I've got we got three keyboards, drum set, cello. Guitar, two guitars, bass, and I guess that's it. And then we've got an acoustic piano upstairs. And in a few minutes, he's going to play them all at the same time. I can oh, only oh, play wow. the keyboards. I, I got here. <laughs> the, keyboards are, the keyboards are the only thing I can play. So should we get started? Yeah, probably. I think we're, I know we're missing at least Adam, perhaps. Maybe a Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yes. But, I mean... They, as they join, they can introduce themselves. So why don't we, I'll, I'll introduce myself first, then we'll go through the faculty meeting. I'm Mark Walker, communicated with some of you, I think. I, uh, I'm in my office right now, which is still legal as of today, I believe. Uh, I do sort of uh, commutative algebra, algebraic K theory, things algebraic in general. And why don't we go on to, I'll just go in the order on my screen. Oh, Marilyn, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Marilyn Johnson. I think I've communicated with all of you. I'm the coordinator for the graduate program. And I'm at home. Okay, Alex, you're next on my screen at least. All right. Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, Alex Zupan. I'm an assistant professor and my research is in topology and geometry. And I've been at UNL for about five years. Tom? 
Uh, hello, my name is Tom Marley. Uh, I am in my house in a very awkward room. This is kind of like our sewing room or whatever. I won't show it to you. Uh, I uh, am chair of the department and uh, I also do commutative algebra. Hey, Christine. Uh, hi, I'm Christine Kelly. I'm an associate professor. Um, I work in coding theory, mostly graph-based codes. Um, and I've been at uh, Nebraska since 2008. Okay, uh, Richard. I'm Richard Rebarber. I'm the graduate chair at the moment. I do research in mathematical biology, and I also work in the area of control theory. Uh, that was my original area. Uh, I have been at the university since 1984. Okay, and Brian, I think you're the last. Yeah, I am uh, Brian Harborn. I work in algebraic geometry and commutative algebra. I have been at the University of Nebraska since, well, I started teaching in 1987. So I've uh, been there almost as long as Richard. Okay, it might be nice to have the uh, visitors introduce themselves. So uh, I'm, I've already forgotten your first name. Last name, Velt. Go ahead and introduce I'm, I'm, your name. Where I'm Nick Velt. I am a senior. This is my last semester at Michigan Technological University. Uh, and I'm about to graduate with a uh, dual degree in mechanical engineering and mathematics. Great, thank you. Uh, Kevin, how about? Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin. I'm graduating from Wake Forest University this year. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Tony? Hi, uh, I'm Tony. Uh, I uh, got my bachelor's degree last year. I uh, graduated from Colgate University, which is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. <laughs> Where are you now? Uh, I'm in Chicago right now. My gap here is a long story. <laughs> gotcha. Is anybody at their uh, institution, or is everybody at home, or their you know where where uh, the parents? You're at your home institution. Okay. Yeah, uh, most of the things have shut down here, and they're doing online classes. But I'm just in the dorms, so I see no real reason to leave, especially when I'm already an introvert and I've got okay. some spare friends around here. Fair enough. You're the only one, I guess. Uh, I'm also staying on campus, actually. Uh, no particular reason, just it's a big thing to move back home. Okay, well. <laughs> okay, how about... So let's, con let's continue with the introductions. Sure. Sorry, I interrupted there. So who's um, next? Did you say Catherine? I'm Catherine Henneberger. Um, I attend Bowdoin College. I'll be graduating this year also a small level arts. Okay, and forgive me for pronouncing this wrong, Nawaj? Oh, um, I'm Nawaz. Yeah. I'm also, I'm graduating from Millican, and well, I like math. Okay, uh, Maya. Hi, I'm Maya. Um, I'm graduating this year from Grand Valley State University. It's in Michigan, so across the lake oh. from Tone. You sort of look like you're sitting in a bathroom somehow. Is that what that is? Uh, I'm not. This is just my dining room right now. There's just a lot of doors. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, Audrey. Hi. Um, I graduated last year from Agnes Scott College, which is in Cato, Georgia. Um, and I'm taking a year and I'm tutoring uh, full time, tutoring kids in math, which is fun. Where are you, Sam, where are you living right now? Uh, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Gotcha. Okay, Jordan. Yeah, I'm a senior at Taylor University. It's a small liberal arts school in kind of the middle of nowhere, Indiana. Um, I'm currently at home, which isn't too far from there. And then I, the next person, you're also named Jordan, if I'm not confused, right? Is that me? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Jordan. I'm at the University of Tennessee right now. <laughs> okay. And then I think, oh wait, so uh, sorry for butchering your name too, but uh, Neil Arnab? Hi, I am Neil. You can just call me Neil. I am from India. 
I'm currently pursuing my master's in mathematics from Chennai Mathematical Institute. So okay. I'll be graduating this year. Okay, and you're, you're talking to us from India right now, I take it. Sorry, could you please repeat? Are you in India right now? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. I'm at my home right now. What time is it there? Uh, it's 2.40 a.m. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Staying Fantastic. awake just for this opportunity. <laughs> Appreciate it. Tessa. Hey, I'm Tessa. I'll be graduating from Case Western Reserve University, although I'm here in Virginia for the remainder of the semester. All right. And then I think since we started the introductions, I think Yvonne has joined us with child. Why don't you introduce yourself, say what kind of, uh, what area you are in. Hi, I'm Yvonne Lai and uh, I'm an associate professor in the department. My, uh, I got my PhD in geometric group theory and hyperbolic geometry. Uh, and now I'm doing math education research. And I made the transition a few years after graduating. All right, so I mean, that's the introductions, of course. Uh, at this point, I was imagining we just open it up to uh, anyone who has a question of a general nature, about a question for a specific person, question about uh, you know, the logistics of the graduate program, anything, everything is open here. So I'm just gonna mute it and you guys ask. I can start, I guess. <laughs> Um, can someone give kind of just a general idea of like the qualifying exams? Sure, sure, I can do that. So um, in your first year, you need to take um, sequences. So we have things organized in sequences. Um, there are, you have to take uh, at least one sequence from the discrete topology or algebra side, and you have to take one sequence from the math differential equations, uh, the, the analysis differential equations side. Uh, then usually in the summer after your first year, you take qualifiers in any two of those areas. And uh, then you just need to pass those. If you don't pass, if you only pass one, then you, then you keep that and you have to pass the other one at some point. Uh, exams are offered in, um, in late May, early June, uh, and then in January. And, and so uh, you have lots of opportunities to take the exams. Um, there is another set of exams, the comprehensive exams. Uh, they, uh, they are very uh, much geared towards what you need. After you find an advisor, you get a committee and you and your committee decide what exams you're gonna take. Sometimes they might be written, sometimes they might be oral. And uh, it's very geared towards what you'll need for your research. But the first set of exams, uh, some people finish after one year, some people finish after one and a half years, some it takes two years. Are there any options to try to take them? I mean, the, when you write them in? Well, you can take them in January. Marilyn, can they, can people take them when uh, right when they come in? I don't think so. Yeah, we do let them take as long as you can show us that you're prepared. We do let first year students take them in January. Oh yeah, no, in January, but they can't take right. them right when they first come in. So January uh, is the first time. We right, it's probably best to take them in January. We have had occasions where somebody has already had the 800 sequence at their previous school and we have let them take them. If you want to do that, you'd want to talk to Richard Mohammed Ramaha, who's our graduate exam coordinator, just so we can make sure that, that you really are prepared to take them. It's a little difficult because you have to travel back to Nebraska to take them. But it's probably better recommended if you want to do that to do them in January when you've had a chance to be here, talk to people, see if you really are ready to take them. And I think there's also access to old exams right? Oh, yes. yes, on our website. So if you're thinking you might want to do it, you can look on our website under resources and there are all the old exams are posted. You could kind of work through them and see if you think you're prepared to take it. Um, within the two years that you're supposed to kind of complete them, is there a limit to how many times you take them? 
Well, just it's just limited by the amount of times can, that okay. they're offered. Okay. So in, in two years, you will typically have three chances. Okay. Thank you. I also don't think people are kicked out, right? Like, right. I mean, if there's no, been, no, no. So it's not a scary situation, if that helps. It's not like you have three tries and then you have to go somewhere else. That's not the case. What happens if you did fail them those three times? Take, you take you take it the January January of your second year. Okay. I mean, you might also try a different exam, like maybe you didn't pick one of them and you realize that that actually is a better choice for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people who want to succeed and work hard do fine, even if it takes several tries or changing topics. Yeah, people do change topics sometimes. And people's interests change too. I mean, you, you come in thinking you're interested in one thing, and then you take a course that you really like and you wind up you, you wind up changing your interests and might even change the exams that you take. One of the benefits of taking it after your first year is we do offer workshops immediately following the spring semester. There are workshops in algebra, analysis, and usually a couple other shortened ones. So if you wait till that first year, you have the opportunity to participate in at least a week long workshop in preparation to take those exams which is usually quite helpful. And uh, once again, I'm gonna ask Marilyn, uh, we can waive some of the, uh, the course sequences if people come in with especially good backgrounds. And so yes. not everybody necessarily takes the course that they're gonna take the exam on because they've already had the material. Correct. That's something you'll discuss with your advisors. So for those of you who are coming in with masters, you very likely have already taken some of these classes. So you would just talk to your advisor, talk to Richard, to decide what makes sense for you. Has, has everybody here used Zoom before? So yeah. I, um, Mark and I were just thinking that uh, maybe for asking questions, maybe you can take a moment to think about what questions you might have and then chat them to the whole group. And then we can see what we have in common or if there's things that play well off of each other. Okay, um, I see there's a couple questions here. Um, uh, there was one on advising and the mentorship program, and maybe um, maybe I'll let um, Richard talk about that, but I can handle the one about the TA duties. Um, so um, virtually all of our first year students come in as, um, uh, teach, uh, as recitation instructors. So we have, um, large lecture calculus at Nebraska is taught in large lectures at least uh, the first two semesters um, and then they they meet with uh, in lecture two or three times a week and then in um, and in the and in the recitations with a TA uh, two days a week um, and so um, usually your first year you're given two recitation section um, so you you would have two classes of about 25 students. Um, and uh, so your actual meeting hours would be, uh, in person in class would be four hours a week. And then you typically would have a couple hours of office hours. And then uh, one of the semesters you would spend um, uh, time, a couple hours a week in our math resource center, which just, you know, your office hours are usually for your own students and in the math resource center, anybody in the course can come and get help. Um, so after that first year, um, the, in the second year, uh, we move uh, our TAs into, they're the, the, they're the instructor for their own course, usually a pre-calculus course like college algebra or trigonometry. 
Um, and uh, so we, in that second year, you would teach uh, one course a semester, so one credit hour course a semester, uh, because it's kind of a transition um, year. And, um, and during that year, we, we also have you take a pedagogy course. So the, for the a three credit hour pedagogy course where you learn about uh, active learning strategies and other things that will help you become a better teacher. Uh, and then after that, after the um, second year, your normal load would be three courses per year. So two, one, two three credit hour courses one semester and then one three credit hour course the other semester. And that can range from, again, pre-calculus courses to uh, things like, uh, well, we have our advanced graduate students teach um, uh, occasionally differential equations or linear algebra or uh, a, math, a math course for elementary school teachers. And then also sometimes a, a course, um, it's kind of a liberal arts, uh, a math course for liberal arts majors. So there, um, there's lots of different avenues, lots of different opportunities to teach different stuff once you get past like the second year. So I don't, uh, so that was from Kevin. Kevin, is that, answer most of what you were asking, wanted to know, or? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was wondering. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Maya, does that answer your question as well? Um, oh, I not, see, didn't see that one. <laughs> uh, what sort of training is there for your first semester? So, um, so the, you, when you come, uh, to campus you come a week early before classes start and there is a, we have a full week of gta training and then um and then you like i said you're usually you're doing calculus recitations and so there's weekly meetings with your the convener of the uh who's ever convening calc one or calc two and you talk about different things there's there is uh i should say the way we we teach the recitations is we've created, um, I guess you'd call a workbook or something for the students to work through. And again, it's kind of an active learning approach where the students work in groups on questions that are, are sort of, that complement the lectures. And you kind of go around the room and uh, it help explain things, or maybe you might call the class to attention and say, I see everybody's getting, uh, caught up in how to apply the chain rule and stuff like that. So we yes, there's there's training at the beginning and then throughout the the year. Catherine asked a question about um, she wants to know more about the advising system and mentorship program. Sorry, I have a toddler that's uh, heading out the door. Uh, all right. So anyway, Catherine, if you scroll back up, um, Catherine says, I would be interested in knowing about the advising system. Right. And no, I, I see it. And so um, I can answer that question. So when you first come into the, into the program, you're assigned an advisor. We have a graduate advisory committee in the department of faculty. And um, so you're assigned one of the people on the graduate advisory committee to be your advisor. Um, and uh, that person will help you decide um, what first year courses to take and what to do if you're having trouble in things or what to do if something is too easy. Um, and so just generally academic advising. Um, and uh, we also have some um, graduate student mentoring. Marilyn, can you talk about that a bit? I, I want to explain something. I, this is, I, I'm not always the graduate chair, and so I've only been doing this for a year, and uh, I'm often deferring to Marilyn to, on the questions that I don't know. So Marilyn, could you talk about the, uh, the yeah. um, graduate mentorship? Graduate student advising board lines up mentors, grad student, older grad student mentors for each of the incoming students. It's someone that you can go to if you have questions, if you are stressed out about something because they've all been through their first year and they're very helpful in that. They do a really good job, not as much as teaching because we have Nathan and Josh and the, the faculty who are teaching the 106, 107 classes, but they're really good support for you as a first year student 
they'll just kind of help you through anything personally, academically that you need in getting settled. They also stay touch with you as you go through the program up until they graduate. Okay. Does that answer your question? Actually, I, I have a bit more. Okay. Okay, so um, after you pass your, uh, your um, qualifying exams, and sometimes even before you pass your qualifying exams, you wanna choose a PhD advisor. And uh, typically you go around to your people in the area that you're interested in. You don't need to uh, know them. Um, all of us are very happy to talk to graduate students. And uh, it, typically you will be given a paper to read, something that will give you some idea about what that person does. I would suggest talking to two or three people and uh, then you would choose an academic, a, a PhD advisor. Of course, the PhD advisor has to have, you know, some advisors are, um, are overwhelmed, but most of the time you can get the advisor you want. And, uh, and if you can get the advisor you want, there's always somebody else in the area who can work with you. Um, so um, you will pick your advisor, usually based on conversations you have and papers that they give you. And also you should talk to other graduate students about this, graduate students who have advisors already. You should talk to, you know, it's a good idea to talk to the advisee, the, the advisees of a particular advisor, uh, you know, to make sure they're happy with them. Um, and then once you choose your advisor, then the two of you choose a, a, a committee and that committee and the advisor are there for pretty much all of your research questions. I mean, um, everybody's really friendly here. And so uh, you could ask anybody, pretty much any of the faculty or graduate students for advice, you'll probably um, get some advice, often good advice. Um, but um, the, your, your main advice is gonna come from your uh, PhD advisor. And so uh, that's, that's sort of, you, you have your early advising and then your later advising. Richard, do you wanna mention the landscape seminar that happens second semester of their first year? Thank you. Yes, we have a seminar at the, um, in, the, in your second semester, which is um, where uh, faculty from different areas come and give talks about their work, usually you know, trying to be accessible. And uh, sometimes it should be viewed as sort of an advertisement for their work. And uh, this will give you an idea of whether an area that you might not be familiar with is appealing to you. So um, the landscape seminar is a good way to get a broad overview of what areas are represented in the department because there'll be you know, 12, 13 talks over the course of the semester you know, could be as many as 15. And uh, you will get a pretty good idea of what sort of research is happening. Also in the, uh, in the summers, there are, there's a math literature course. And that math, math literature course, you usually go to somebody who's working might be interested and say, hey, is there a paper that I can read and present in the summer? And so that's a good way to get to know whether you like an area as well by uh, by presenting a paper in that area in the math literature course. Most people take the math literature course after their first year unless they're doing an internship. And we have a lot of people doing internships in the summer. So in which case you would just wait, for, you know, you'd wait until a later, uh, a later year to do your uh, math literature course. I just want to say something about um, what Richard was, uh, what Richard mentioned before about how you're always welcome to talk to any faculty member. Um, this isn't just some line, this is reality. Um, I mean, that's something that I did myself when I was a grad student. I talked to a lot of faculty outside of people that were in my own like research interest and that was really good for me. And then here, I mean, I've had people come ask me about, you know, what's going on in their life, what's going on and what's going on with the department like people that work in algebra, people that work in math biology, and of course my own students in math education, but I just wanted to emphasize that this is like, that having that kind of an open community is something that I really think makes Nebraska special and part of why at least I enjoy being faculty here. Um, 
I can uh, handle the question on the number of hours graduate students are expected to work. So, um, so yeah, so being a graduate student uh, uh, su uh, supported on a GTA, I mean, it's, you are, I think the official line is you are, uh, well, you are, you are technically both an employee and a student, um, uh, and your, your stipend is, is to support you in both your instructional work and your studies. Uh, so, so it is a full-time job. Um, so whether that means 40 hours a week or, or, or whatever, yes. Now, with regard to your TA duties, um, we, we estimate that in your first year, um, you're, you're the, the, if, well, you're, you're doing a total of eight contact hours and we estimate that to be around 14 hours per week on average. Not every week is going to be the same. Um, some weeks you'll have exams and there'll be a lot of grading time and other weeks, uh, there, there won't be as much work, um, but on average about 14 hours. And then, um, and then, um, when you're in your third or fourth or whatever year, you're teaching three, three credit hour courses on average, your, um, your work might, your hours might be 15 to 16 hours per week. But again, this is, this is going to vary by individual, of course. Um, some people, um, well, I mean, just, it's the same thing with, you know, in some sense, how much time it takes you to complete a homework assignment is going to vary in by individual, but um, those are our best estimates. Um, so we, we try to keep it to less than 20 hours per week. Uh, and I think that's the reality for most graduate students. Is there, was there another part of that? Uh, no. Okay. Can I uh, Maybe somebody else, some other faculty member can handle the research seminars. Well, let, I think can I add, he wanted to add. Well, let me add to what Tom said. So it, I would say to, to everyone, wherever you go, that's a challenge that, that all grad students face and frankly all of us face is balancing teaching and research. And, and it's really easy to get overwhelmed with teaching responsibilities. And I know that, you know, for my teaching assistants, at least, I, I try to be conscious of the boundaries that, that people should have with regard to the amount of time they're spending teaching. And, and so no matter what you do, I, I encourage you to communicate with the instructors you're working with. And, and especially if you think that you're spending too much time or more than that 20 hours a week on your teaching duties, because it's, it's so easy to get sucked into emails and your undergraduate students and, and every aspect of that. And, and if I, you have a chance to talk to other grad students about it, they can probably give you like an even better perspective since they're the ones living it right now. So this is a good time to advertise that tomorrow at four o'clock central time, there'll be something like this, except much more useful because you can, you can talk to a group of graduate students here. And I would very strongly encourage people to do that because, um, because they will be your peers and uh, they will give you answers that are probably extremely relevant to what you're interested in. Um, I see three new questions. The middle one seems awfully hard. Um, uh, the research seminar one is easy. We, we want people to go to research seminars as soon as they feel ready. Um, they are absolutely unequivocally open to uh, first year students. And we, we want people to attend as, as much of that as they can. Um, the last, or the one, what do graduate students usually do in the summer? I'm gonna field that one also. Um, there, you, we support the vast majority of our graduate students over the summer, usually with teaching. We have, uh, you know, we have regular summer courses. There are summer ed courses for high school teachers uh, that are available th through a center um, that is associated with the university. Uh, some people get support. Uh, if, if your advisor has a grant that can help um, with um, research support, some people will get that as well. Let me, just, 
let me sorry let me just add that uh the courses for teachers are one or two weeks long in the summer they're not like the entire summer right but that but they're pretty intense no they're full-time you wouldn't be doing anything else during those weeks but it's right. at least like compartmentalized so that you can do other things yeah yeah and the, and the, the other courses are five-week courses so they don't take up your whole summer but but they are a source of support So th there's the question about a possible travel ban. I'm going to attempt this, Tom. You can you can jump in if I don't do this well. Oh, but I'm sorry. Can I can I say one more thing about summer plans? Please. Um, so all of the above are things that graduate students have done and enjoyed. Um, and then the other thing that some of our students uh, do, maybe in the like in you know. Not, not necessarily their first year, but maybe later on, is uh, there's a number of students who've gotten internships in national labs and, and, like, and nonprofits. And so that's something, else that, uh, that's something else that grad students sometimes will do in the summer. Yeah, quite, more and more people are doing that now. That's, yeah, Susan that, Hermiller has, uh, has been instrumental in this and like, has right. put together a lot. Yes, uh, yes, we do have a lot of people doing internships. Uh, at, at government labs or industries. Um, we have one place in Lincoln, in fact, that has frequently offered internships. They, they do some years and not other years. Uh, one of my PhD students did one of, the, uh, uh, one of those, one of my recent PhD students, and, it, and it, um, the topic he was working on turned into his thesis topic. So, so internships are, are a very good source of both experience and income. So as far as the travel ban goes, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to guess what's gonna happen, but we have to assume that if you can't travel, we're also probably going to be continuing with our online courses. We, we as pretty much all of your institutions have, uh, are moving um, to online teaching. We're gonna get better and better at it. And uh, if you can't travel, chances are our courses are gonna wind up um, being um, being taught online. So that is my best guess. That, uh, is, is that Nee who asked that Neil. question? Yeah. Neil? Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. There, there could be, uh, there could be international travel bans, but not domestic. Oh, yes, travel. that's right. right. So, uh, yeah. It's, it's really hard to say, <laughs> like, uh, very, we don't even know what's going to happen literally in the summer uh, at this point. So um, right. we will obviously be in touch with you as things become clearer about, um, you know, the start of the school year, whether or not international students will be able to come and this sort of thing. Um, at, at this point, everything that we were going to say would be a guess, but we will, we will also commit to keeping everybody informed of where, where UNL is in that. The Office of Graduate Studies and the International Scholars Office will also be staying in touch with you, Neil, to make sure that you know they keep you informed on what's going on. They're the ones who process all the paperwork for the international mm -hmm. students. So you will probably hear from them before you hear from us as to processes and what's gonna happen. I just suggest that you stay in touch with us as we know and as you know and as you have questions and with the International Scholars Office. And we'll try to make sure you're kept in the loop as much as we possibly can. For the, uh, for the question about um, TA ships, how much of the course materials are pre-made versus how much flexibility? Um, both. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the great things about the teaching here is that, and I'm sure all of the other faculty will agree with this, like we're very, I mean, we're very much about sharing materials with each other. Like I can't, I mean, there was like a class here where, I mean, like that I had made some materials that I've passed on to other people. And then, but then also pretty much like I haven't really taught anything without materials that somebody else gave me. And so I think that in some sense, like some of the course materials are pre-made uh, and there's objectives that you might, that you know, depending on what kind of prerequisites the, the course satisfies, there are some objectives you're going to have to try to make. Um, but on the other hand, uh, 
I mean, we, we trust people here to, to make the kind of pedagogical decisions that serve them best. I think that, let me just add that, um, you know, usually for, for every course there would be a syllabus, but within, within that syllabus, there would be a chance for, for you to be creative in how you're delivering that material. But typically for these courses, say, um, say a course like Math 300, which is our course for elementary, math course for elementary school teachers, um, there's, there's a faculty convener and maybe three, two or three other graduate students teaching that course. And so they would meet as a group and discuss their ideas and, and, uh, and get guidance from their, from the convener. Um, would it be fair to say that as uh, the more experience you have, the more likely you're going to get an assignment that um, that is um, requires some creativity? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, so, uh, I mean, it's a combination of experience and um, and it's also um, you know, whether or not you request these kinds of assignments. So our vice chair, who's not able to attend this Zoom right now, you, you can approach him and say, um, or, I mean, we always ask for, for graduate students and faculty to request what they want to teach, but you could go talk to the vice chair and say, you know, I'm really interested in teaching this kind of course, or if that's available, or do you think that's a possibility for me? And, uh, and that's a conversation that you can have, you know, in your, you know, third year uh, and up usually. I'll answer the question on the PhD minor, or at least something. Um, so I'm in coding theory, which is interdisciplinary with uh, computer science and electrical engineering. And two out of my five grad students either completed or are completing a minor in electrical engineering. So it's a personal choice if you want to do that. It's something like you do five courses at the graduate level in that other field and have a faculty member in that department on your committee. That's a rough gist of what getting a minor entails. Um, and it should make sense for your research field. Richard, you might be able to say more in general how many people do it? Um, actually, I don't know how many people do it. I have. Uh, um, it's very easy to take courses outside of your uh, outside of mathematics. In fact, in several areas, coding theory is a, a great example. My area, people you will take biology courses, statistics courses. It will really help them on the PhD. Uh, the um, as far as minors go, I don't think it's that common. But I actually don't know how many people do it. You can, you can certainly do it. Marilyn, do you have any idea how many people have done minors? It's not that common. For the most part, it is anybody who's doing a minor in computer science, and there's only like one, I think, that I can think of offhand, and then the people doing coding theory that are doing minors in electrical engineering. Almost everybody else, they take classes in the other discipline, but they don't necessarily pick up a minor in that area. Yeah. Just for a, just a very weird situation, one of my PhD students is actually getting a minor in music. But that's it's a very unusual situation. So I don't take that as being typical at all. But I guess the point is that it's easy to do if you want to. Can uh, Christine or Yvonne, one of you, uh, handle the question about support for women in, in the, our department and the AWM chapter? We do have an AWM chapter um, and a lot of grad, and, uh, and there's like a bunch of grad students that have been uh, that have been doing activities with it. Um, and so that's something that you might want to ask about when you meet with the grad students on, when did you say it was, Richard? Um, Friday? Um, when? It's tomorrow at 4 p.m. Oh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Yeah, so I think time. that's something Tomorrow at 4 o'clock Central Time. Okay. Yeah, but they have, um, but they have get-togethers and they also have, uh, and they also have like talks and, um, and sessions for undergrads and, uh, and then as far as community of support for women, um, I don't know how to, well, I guess I kind of want to say that's, that's like, that's the whole community. <laughs> like, I think, I mean, I think something that does make UNL special is um, like, is how supported women do feel. Yeah, our department is actually known for that. And at the graduate student level, we have about 50% 
women or close to it? Uh, I mean, I, I guess like I could say more, but it's like, it's just like you would just be hearing me talk about my emotions and that like, and using words like happy and joyful and pleasure and, you know, warm and supported. Uh, but really, if you want to get the picture of it in more concrete detail, you should ask a grad student, you should ask the grad students about it. I like, I think it's great. Like from a faculty perspective, like I couldn't be happier. <laughs> Let me add that um, if if people are interested in being involved in supporting women in math, we have the Nebraska Conference for Undergraduate Women in Mathematics, which is a very popular and well-known conference. Um, I mean, I recognize some of the names in this group because of that conference. So I know that we have some attendees that are that are here right now. So so we get a number of people, a number of women coming to UNL for grad school because of the conference. But the point is, is that if you want to be involved in the effort, we have grad students on the committee every year. So Christine is a past co-chair or she's going to be co-chair and i'm going to be co-chair with christine for the conference next year and uh we have a number of grad students that get really excited about the conference and help out so that's something we certainly encourage everybody to do uh, mark do you want to take the graduate courses and sizes and styles okay um <laughs> So sizes, so the, there's the standard, you know, two Smith long sequences, the inner level that Richard talked about towards the very beginning. And those would be our largest graduate classes. And they probably have anywhere from 15 to maybe as many as 25 students. Does that sound about right to others who teach these courses? 25 is the high end. 25 so is about the high end. That's probably yeah. more, more first year courses are like around 20. I'd yeah. Oh, some. Right. Sorry, some are quite small, like ten. Yeah, I was. I was describing the biggest courses we have. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the biggest one we have would be twenty-five. Uh, I'm teaching the first year uh, graduate algebra course right now, and I think there's eighteen students in it. So that's that's typical. And then you get into the nine higher level courses; they're typically much smaller. So um, they can range anywhere from probably six to 12 on average for number of classes. Uh, style of teaching um, probably depends a lot on the instructor. I mean, some, some would have more of a straight lecture style, but you know, because the classes are small and you're talking to your peers, uh, I think most people would make them highly interactive. I know I do. I, mean, I tend to more or less do a straight lecture style for graduate level, but I try to make it as interactive as possible. And the grad students, I think, are by and large very comfortable interrupting me, you know, constantly with questions, which is very healthy, of course. Um, some some uh, professors I know will do more with like having a project-based class. So there'll be some lecture, but then maybe the students will take turns presenting material or even will work on independent projects and present the, the results of that. Anyone else want to describe varying styles for graduate courses? I think the courses change. Um, I mean, it's, it's different in the 800 level than the 900 level. The 800 level tends to have a lot of homework and tends to be geared towards uh, both passing the exams and also developing basic skills. The 900 level courses are very more. Some of them have a fair amount of homework. When I teach analytic function theory, I do give a lot of homework, but some don't have um, uh, that much. I think the 900 level courses are more free form, whereas the 800 level courses, because there's a, because there's a, a, a very specific type of, um, a, a very specific syllabus of material that has to be covered, do tend to be focused on the stu a lot of the, the students doing work themselves as opposed to just hearing about it. Maya, does that answer your question or do you mean something different um, when you were talking about styles of teaching? That, that answers it perfectly, yeah. Maya, you probably know Lauren Keel, right? You're at Grand Valley, so she yeah. can also obviously tell you lots of things. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, we can answer pretty much anything about 
I mean, you know, not just our department, about the university, about the town. It's a good town to live in. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be here for four or five, six years, it's, you know, it's, it's a good place. That to, um, the, the university is downtown, which, uh, which means that it doesn't feel that isolated. So I'm seeing some more questions. Nick has a good question. He, um, well, let me mention something. Uh, I mean, the, the town has a great uh, trail system. And so uh, you could live anywhere in the city and basically bicycle to campus if you like. Yeah, I mean, Brian and I bike in, bike in you know, most days. And we have some faculty who, I guess Brian does too, bike in all days. I, I don't bike in when there's, there's snow or ice on the ground, but um, I bike in the vast majority of days. And it's pretty too. And the, the, the I don't, are... Sorry, I don't know if this is relevant to any of you, but Lincoln is a great place for young children as well. There's lots of things for kids in Lincoln. I don't know. I mean, there are grad students with children, so. And when Richard says it's pretty, that's true, but it's also pretty flat. So in terms of biking, uh, it's easy to do. If you're a really serious uh, bicyclist, it's not that much of a challenge. Right. So a couple of you will ask you about housing, and probably that's a better question to ask grad students because they obviously have more direct experience. But most grad students do not live on campus. There is the opportunity to live in a dorm if you're a graduate student, but for whatever reason, very few of the grad students uh, take advantage of that opportunity. I think it's I think it's actually cheaper to live off campus, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, so I know some of them will, you know share a house with others others will just have apartments um, a lot of them live probably somewhere in the one to two mile range from campus and so commute in uh, on foot or uh, by bike or whatever there's there's also a bus system the, the one problem with the bus system is it stops running relatively early in the evening so that can be an issue for some people but as far as like housing prices you're obviously much better off asking someone who's rented an apartment recently well, Christine might be able to talk a little bit about housing in terms of rentals. But one thing I, I want to just mention is that housing in general is cheaper in Nebraska maybe than anywhere else in the country. Well, that's a bit, I'm not so sure anywhere else in the country, but, but it's, it's certainly a lot cheaper than, than, most, yeah, than at most universities. So this is a question that comes up every year. Um, and it's, it's a really relevant question, right? Because you want to know whether you can actually afford to live in the place that you want to go to grad school. Um, and so I think, uh, Marilyn, I think you've, like, you've forwarded this question onto grad students before, and overwhelmingly the answer has been, it's Lincoln is an affordable, nice place to live. Yes, yes. You can probably find an apartment in the downtown area. We used to say 450 to 500, that has now gone up the last couple of years, but 500, 550 will get you a nice apartment where you can live by yourself. We have a lot of new <laughs> complexes that are on the, you rent a bedroom and share the whole apartment with other people. We do have some grad students in those situations. Those are very nice new apartments that are close to campus. I don't know if that's the cheapest route, but it's certainly very nice upscale apartments. The Ask the Grad Students tomorrow night, there are some first year students on that panel, there's some upper level students on that panel. They can give you an idea of what they currently pay and what their apartment situation is. Yeah, we're not trying to buck the question, we just wanna make sure you're getting like information from the ground that's accurate. Um, and then one thing about, one other thing about the bus system, like if, you, if you've met Jamie Radcliffe, he takes the bus almost every day. Um, so it's a it's a pretty workable system. Um, it's it runs every like depending on the line it runs every you know 20 or 30 minutes or an hour um, And like I'll take I take the bus sometimes as well. I mostly I prefer biking if I can um, So office space um, So first of all every graduate student has an office <laughs> So we we give you one um, the first year students, we like to kind of group together uh, to kind of uh, form a cohort, a cohesive, you know, friendship kind of uh, work, work cohort as well. 
So they, we put um, uh, like, there's like three or four offices with, uh, that can hold four or five graduate students. So most of the first year, our first year class will probably, I mean, we, we usually try to aim for like around 15 students. And so we usually have them together in three or four offices. And then, um, and then after that, um, graduate students are usually in offices of two or three students. There is a couple other bigger offices uh, that um, are sometimes desirable because they have windows. I will say that most graduate students' offices don't have windows, um, except for a few of the larger ones that uh, the more advanced students ask for. Uh, but, um, but I think everybody pretty much has a comfortable working environment there to study and hold office hours. Uh, there are other places, both in Avery and elsewhere on campus, um, to to work. Um, there's we have the math library in the basement, which has uh, study carols, and it's a quiet place. I I see most of our students are most of our advanced students at least uh, at one of the coffee shops that I attend. <laughs> um, there's several really nice coffee shops that uh, it, it'd be hard pressed to walk in there and not see some graduate math graduate students working together. I work at coffee shops a lot. It's very rare for me to go into a coffee shop near campus and not, not find math graduate students there. Well, and math faculty. I guess that. you do too, John, work in coffee shops a lot. And, there's, there's always, there seems to be always graduate students there. As far as uh, Avery, there are lounge areas. They're not necessarily the best places to work because, because people, you know, will, they're, they're somewhat heavily trafficked. Uh, you could always, you know, at least in the afternoon, find, you know, find a place to work in Avery. Uh, if, if your office is busy, if your office is uh, those lounges, I've seen so I've seen grad students working on problem sets in those lounges, so that they can share the blackboard. Yeah, that's true, because they do, yeah that's true. The blackboard does does help. We also have a nice collection of seminar rooms that you'll see. I mean, they're used for seminars, uh, but when they're not being used for that, a lot of times the grads on grading problem sets. So those are those are nice rooms. Uh, also, just the, second, the fact that the fantastic coffee shop town. And then one other thing is that one of our current graduate students, whose name is Nicole, is she went around a couple of days ago and did a video tour of the department. So I'm assuming that will include video showing what the offices look like and what the library looks like. She unfortunately was having a very hard time uploading it to the system. So, um, but once that gets taken care of, I will forward a link or something to everyone so I can look at that video. They've also remodeled the first floor of our main <sighs> love library that is very nice. It has a Dunkin' Donuts. It has study rooms you can sign up for. It has study carols. Some of our grad students take advantage of going over there and studying as well. Um, so, uh, Maya asks, how many people that come to get a PhD graduate with a PhD? Uh, wow. And let's see, Catherine just followed that up with uh, how many years is that taking? So um, now, um, uh, so let me, let me first say that um, I can't quote exact data uh, uh, because <sighs> It really is a question, like, I think the best answer is that pretty much everybody uh, that comes to get a PhD and wants to continue to work on getting their PhD eventually gets their PhD. Um, we do, of course, have people that, that leave after a master's degree because after a couple years, they find out that their interests really lie and maybe getting a job in, in, a, in an industry right away, they, 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 they find that. Um, so I would say it's it, one or two students a year might choose to leave the program voluntarily. If you're asking how many people just get kicked out because they're not making progress, it's almost zero. Um, it's not zero, though. It's, it's, not, it's close to zero. It's close to zero, yes. Um, I, I'm the one who makes reappointment decisions. Um, so, um, 
I'm the one who, so, so um, usually people will only want to continue in the program if they're getting a, a, a support, you know, so they're getting a GTA, a TA appointment or whatever. So those are, I make those decisions. Um, we, we pretty much guarantee people support uh, through five years. Um, I, I actually think that we should change our documents so that it's through six. And then it's not unusual for people if they need it. Um, and it's not that many, but if they need it a seventh year. But I think the average time to PhD in our overall is about 5.5 years. Um, and I can say that um, in my four years as chair, um, out of 80 graduate students each year, I've only reappoint, not chosen not to reappoint one or possibly two people because of insufficient progress. So that's a pretty small percentage. Um, and they would have had, sorry, they would have had lots of warning and conversations. It wouldn't have been out of the blue. I've never heard of anybody who's making progress towards their PhD getting cut off from funding. I've been, you know, been here for 35 years and just, as, I don't think it's happened. I can add a little bit to Catherine's uh, follow-up question about, I mean, I know that Tom said the average is probably five and a half. So some students finish in five, some students finish in six. Um, as an advisor, I can say that that decision is something that you'd probably have a conversation with your advisor about. Um, some students might change their research field, which would mean that six years would make more sense for them because they start the progress on their dissertation later on. Uh, other people might feel, it's also based on the job market. If um, some students might do a small job search in the fifth year, and if they don't like what they get, stay for a sixth year. Um, and it's also a decision based on like when your actual dissertation research is done, your graduate uh, letter writers can actually write better letters. So it might make sense to stay for the sixth year so that your letters reflect the work you did. Whereas if it's the year before, they might not be able to say as strong statements. So there's a lot of factors. Um, I think people that want to graduate in five could if they're diligent, but sometimes six is a smarter choice depending on what your goals are and what the job market is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that. the bottom the bottom line is we really like when grad students are employed after they graduate. Catherine, you had a question about how many actually get a master's along the way. The vast majority of our students pick up a master's because all of your coursework, your exams, everything you do satisfies the requirements for a master's. So all you're doing is paying your twenty-five dollars to apply for graduation. So it, it's kind of not worth it to not do it. So I would say the vast majority of our students pick up a master's just along the way to their PhD. By the way, one thing I'll mention is that on our website, if you, I can send you the link, but if you search around a bit, you'll find a list of all of the PhD degrees we've granted in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years or something. So you can get a pretty good sense of how many people get a PhD per year, what kind of jobs they have, et cetera. It's, it's a nice little, uh, little list. Um, are there, it's been about an hour, so I'm wondering if it's maybe a good time to stop or is there one last question anyone wanted to squeeze in? I have, I have one last question for you, which is, uh, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but I've been secretly recording this entire episode <laughs> because there was someone that wanted to participate but couldn't make it at this time. Um, if anyone is uncomfortable having the video shared, how about you just send me an email so you can privately say, hey, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I would only share it with people like you who are interested in our program. I wouldn't be posting the video public in any fashion. But again, if you for any reason are uncomfortable with that, just send me an email, let me know, and I won't do it. Let me add one thing to what uh, Mark said. Actually, this list of our PhDs goes back to the beginning of time. 1898. It shows every PhD ever. And so when you get your PhD, oh, he's right on that list. Let me also say if any of you 
you want to talk to me specifically at a different time, just send me an email and probably the other faculty feel the that's, same I way. I think that's, that's certainly true for me, especially since I'm grad chair. But um, if you have any, if you have any uh, questions that you didn't want to talk about here, or if something just occurs to you, please send an email to one of us. And actually, our graduate students are also very friendly. If you somehow become aware of a grad student that you'd like to contact us to ask them some questions, feel free to do it. Almost everybody would be happy to, uh, to correspond with you. Can I add something about your offer letters? Because things are gonna be a little uncertain with how often we're gonna be in the office, if you decide to accept, decline our offer, would you just kind of shoot Jamie, Mark, me, somebody an email so that we know what you're going to do because we may have a delay in actually receiving hard copy mail here for a little while and we don't know how long that will be so it'd be helpful if you could just drop an email to one of us just so we know kind of where you stand on things Marilyn isn't it allowed to just sign and scan it is you can sign them and scan them and mail them in if you want we may at some point need an actual signature for payroll, but we can always do that down the road if we need it. So that is always an option too, to just sign it and send it in to us. And I collect all of those. So if you want to just send it to me, that's fine. Does anyone have questions about their offer letters? They're kind of lengthy in some cases and have a lot of stuff in them. No, that's good. Glad to hear that. We're really easy to get a hold of. We have nowhere to go <laughs> in front of our computers a lot of the day. You probably are too. So, so if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you guys so much. Well, and, and thank you for taking the time and, and joining this conversation. It was nice to meet you all. Yep. Ditto. Paul, wave goodbye. Hopefully we get to meet in person. <laughs> <laughs> Take care and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It was definitely worth staying up. Now <laughs> <laughs> you can go to sleep. <laughs> Good luck with all of your decisions. I hope you find a place that, uh, that works for you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.